a seminar today at the American Karate Studios. It's an open seminar taking place in Delaware. My school is in Reading, Pennsylvania. We're going to teach and demonstrate three very popular katas that either come out of China or into Okinawa. They, I understood they come out of China as one continuous kata or form, and they were broken down into several different forms, so you will notice uh, uh, probably some moves and forms that you do. And we're going to do what we call bow one. We're going to do bow, bow one, bow two, bow three. Bow one, my hands are held in this manner, which also trains you for what we call the Joe stick. Bow two, my hands are held in this manner. And in bow exercise number three, the hands actually get to leave. The purpose of the bow, if the hands leave the bow, one hand is always solid. You should never drop a bow stick because one hand is always in control. One thing to note with the bow, and I'll bring this up again during my instruction, but one hand is a guide hand and the other is a power hand. People that use a bow improperly tend to use both hands with equal strength and it looks like a club when it moves. You must move one with a steering pattern or to shift or guide the bow and the other hand would deliver the power. The same as if you were pulling and punching someone with an empty hand technique. Cut up bow one. Bow two. <laughs> Kata, bow two. What you got last time was bow one. Today you're going to do bow two. If you don't know bow one, th it doesn't matter. This is your form. This is your bow one if you get up at a tournament. You don't get up and say bow two, even though it is. It is when you know three of them. You understand what I'm saying? If you got up and said bow two, if one of the judges, if you scored a tie, he'd say, well, do your first one. You go, I don't know a first one. <laughs> then he'd say, why did you do the second one? So that would cause confusion. So you just automatically, any form you know is your first one. Then when you learn the second one, then you put them in order. The three forms, the way I understood it, come out of China. They were one continuous kata or form. I do know that the beginning and the endings all fit together so that they will flow together. The ending for 
for the uh, first one is the opening for the second one and the third one etc the one you're going to do today is bow two for those of you here for the first time as i said that'll be your first one that's all you have to know any one of the three katas go together we have people that compete in my school they get up in a tournament and do bow one and two we have some that do two and three we have some that do one and three or three and then one you can re do them in any given order just any of these two fit together the beginning and the endings all match for instance as we end ended bow one those of you did we ended with a spear down the second bow form opens up with this so it just goes right into that move the first or third bow form moves off to that pattern so you can end the first one with this and pick it up with this going off on that angle so that's all you have to do is, is put the beginning the end and keep it going as one continuous kata you will see the same katas with various names that is because in this country we lack an understanding of the Japanese language and a lot of people would make up a name for the kata or form or related to their school or system. You'll see these bow katas called Sakagawa bow, Shimabuku bow, Miyazara bow. They're the three names that we've labeled on bow one, two, and three. I understood when they come out of China, they were called Shishi no Kan, and that was just one long bow form. But the labeling became the system of Shimabuko or the system of Sakagawa. He favored one of these forms and taught it, or a piece of one of these forms and taught it. So that's the weapon we're going to do today. I'm going to introduce you to some of the other weapons. As I tell you about the weapons, they were all farmers' instruments, and they all meant someone's life. So they were the Okinawan masters that I've seen for uh, do weapons were better with one weapon than the rest. Now, I wouldn't say that to them if I was in a seminar, but my own judgment was I saw many of the masters get up and do all five of the weapons, and they were tremendously good with one. You wouldn't want to get near them when they had that one in their hand, and the others they were, they were good at or teaching, but they were superb with one, and that's because they lived and breathed with that weapon. And in years past, that weapon meant life or death to them. So even a bow today is for sport. You're going to do it for sport, and you're just interested on how fast you can move it, not how strong you can whip that weapon. You want just speed and look good, and you're going to win a tournament because it's sport. I doubt you're going to have one of these weapons with you for real self-defense. When I first got into weapons, I, I used to carry the nunchaku around for years in my car. Thinking if I get in a self-defense situation, I'm going to get out the nunchaku and beat somebody to death with it. I got in two real confrontations over about 20, 30 years, and I never had the nunchaku with me. They were always in the car. <laughs> you see, so they were under the seat of the car, so the weapon didn't do me any good. The uh, nunchaku was used, everybody likes this weapon, because of Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee used these in the movies, popularity. I was one of the first people in the United States to compete with this weapon. You can read that in early magazines in the 60s. One of the first people to compete. There were other people using them. I learned this particular weapon from a man named James Kaufman. I learned uh, my bow from uh, a man named Sam Pearson. And I learned some of the uh, nunchuck forms from Sam Pearson. A uh, person you don't know, but he was a Marine teaching in the Washington, D.C. area. He's now down in the Carolinas. And these people I had credit with my, my weapons instruction. Learned a lot of weapons from uh, Daniel Pye. This particular weapon, they used with the flailing pattern, but they didn't know that they were used to knock rice loose from the stalks. And, it, and it's just a flailing action is all that takes place with the weapon. And they, they hit and they move the weapon like this. They used it for self-defense. That's only show. The real combat swings with this weapon we, we actually listen to where you hear a whooshing sound. Now, if you listen, you'll hear a whoosh, and you can judge where the power of that weapon is by where the whoosh takes place, the noise. If it's down here, it was too low. If it's up here, it's too high. It's got to be here. To have complete control of the weapon, 
that whoosh should take place here. That's maximum power. The weapon leaves, no power, goes to maximum power, to no power. To have control of the weapon, I shouldn't hit myself. Yet I should have a full power swing if you were coming near me. Hear the whoosh? That's full power swinging and the way the weapon would really be used. If you're coming at me, I would hold the weapon and let loose full power. But yet to have control of it, it shouldn't come back here and hit me. Wouldn't be controlling the weapon. The sickles or comma were my favorite weapon. When I used to compete, I won all the major tournaments in the country in weapons. I did it with this weapon. Second, if I tied, was my nunchucks. Third, I would go to size. Fourth, I would go to bow. But th this was my favorite weapon. Maybe because I met a man named Hohan Sokin and watched him use this weapon. This was his favorite weapon. I told the story of Hohan Sokin. He used to throw these weapons into a target and be able to stick a target like people in this country do darts or throw knives. And he could just throw these. He would take eight or ten in his hands and throw them into a target and stick them. So, I mean, if you were running away from this individual, he'd take one of these and just put it in your back at 10, 15 feet. He'd throw the weapon with complete accuracy. In 1972, he did a demonstration in Pittsburgh, and he was surrounded by an audience. And he was going to take a target that was only about this big around, have one of his instructors hold it on the arm, and actually just move at will around the stage. And they were going to, th he was going to throw sickles or commas into this target. We actually had a black belt meeting as to whether we should let him do this, because we were afraid he was going to miss a target and kill someone, because the audience was sitting like you were. There was no protection, and the audience was around the stage. And you got to remember, <coughs> in 1972, he was 83 years old. So we were thinking, but he'd been practicing throwing this weapon, we understand, since he was a child. And he took this weapon. Well, first of all, we tried to talk him out of it, and he wouldn't let us. He said, I'm doing that demonstration. No one's going to stop me. So how do you stop an 83-year-old 10th degree black belt? So he went through with his demonstration, got standing ovations, took, took the commas, and just laced them into the target, full speed, just throwing them. And he was throwing this weapon for, I guess, 60, 70 years. They say he started when he was a child throwing commas in trees, and he just got better and better. And he, everyone made the target. No one got injured. The whole climax of that was when he did a kamakata. He had the string on <clears throat> and laced to the thumb. And the string was about, I guess, about 8, 10 feet long. And he did this kamakata. And he is moving with this weapon. And he is putting it all around the body. And all of a sudden, he turns to the audience. Now, they saw him throw the kama. And he throws a kama right at the audience. And the comma goes out from him about eight feet, ten feet, lands in a perfect stick position in midair. And he just snaps it back into his hand with the rope and completes the kata. And he got a standing ovation for that, naturally. But the whole amazement was that 200 people hit the floor. <laughs> there, there were some injuries that day. People hit their heads. They thought he lost it and just threw the, the sickle at somebody. And they saw it coming at them. And they dove on the floor and ran up the aisles, and there were injuries. So he didn't injure anyone with these, but the threat. So this is the comma. They say they were used to block like this, to block and punch with the handle and stick with the blade. And this is what we use for the sport version and, and the explanation of the sport. But in reality, anyone that I've talked to that was a real Okinawan master has said to me, if you had these in your hand with the blades out fighting someone, why would you ever do that? You wouldn't, right? You would leave them out. And the early katas were done with them constantly out. So when you see this kind of emotion taking place, you see this, 
and you see this in the fold and the punching, that's a sport version of the same form. It does show you have some control of the weapon, but the weapon was held out for actual combat and stayed out. Same with the tunfa. The tunfa were rice grinders. They would grind rice with the tunfa. They use these in combat. These are the sport version. That's the sport movement, that I would block with this, punch with that, strike with that, and as you strike, swirls like the nunchuck. But I was told when they fought with these, they kept them this way, and then this is the way that they would fight with the actual tunfa. That's just part of the history of these weapons. They use these as rice grinders, so they might have them in their belt going to or from uh, work, and they use those for self-defense. The wood is of teak. This pair were given to me by Hohan Soken. <coughs> he gave me these personally. And the teak wood being so strong that uh, a samurai sword will not cut through it. You can take a, a, a teak wood bow, teak wood uh, tunfa, and, and hold it up and a sword coming down will lock into it, it'll cut into it, but it won't cut through it. In fact, it'll cut into it and you probably won't get your sword back, and then you should have been hit with the other weapon. So that's the use of that. The size <coughs> and the size were also used to fight like this. Early katas were this way, were this way. This is just sport with the side. Twirling, saying that you punch with this, twirl to block, strike, etc that these moves are sport version. Again, if you had a sharp weapon, you would leave them out like this. They use these weapons today in Japan. My wife uses these weapons at home. She beats me with them. <laughs> she takes this particular weapon when she's planting, and you just punch a little hole in the ground and put in a seed when you're planting out in the garden. And we saw that over in Japan. We were uh, just in Japan last year, and we, were, we were, saw the Japanese woman with a sai, several of them. And they would go out and they'd just punch a little hole and put it, drop a seed in, squeeze it. And that's the way they'd plant out in the garden. And they'd use their side to measure the distance between what they were uh, planting and just punch a little hole. So these weapons were used that way. I was told originally, though, they were a drop pin. If you go out to any of the uh, stores that sell tractors, you'll see a same similar type pin that holds a wagon on the cart. It just drops in like this and stays in place. Originally, these were a drop pin that <coughs> held ox onto the ox cart. And they would work the fields, and it would just hold it like that, drop in. They used to have a third one as a spare inside in case one snapped. They practiced using these for real self-defense in the period of time when the Japanese took over Okinawa. And this was their only defense. Their weapons were taken away, so they pulled out these drop pins and actually sharpened them to blades here. If you get to... Uh, an oriental museum and you see a real pair of size, you'll see that this is a knife blade. This became a knife blade. This became a knife blade. This octagon shape is just to show you a sport version, but this would be an actual knife blade here. This would be knife out here, smooth on the insides, and knife blades here. That is a real pair. When we were in Japan, we got through a uh, ninja castle, an authentic one, and we saw a lot of the authentic weapons, and we saw an authentic pair of sides, <coughs> and it was just total knife blades. The only thing smooth was in here for the hands. And when they would throw this particular weapon, no matter where it would get you, it was going to stick or cut you. So they would pull that one and throw it, and then whip the other two out, and they would, would fight with it, supposedly uh, blocking a samurai sword with one like that and catching the other. But that's what I was told when we did this version, or the sport version with the side. Then I was told that they actually got them out and just fought with them in the out position and left them that way, and they would try to catch the sword like that and stab their opponent with the other one and or just break the blade of the sword with the remaining side. Weapon you're going to do today is the bow. <clears throat> the two deadliest people that I've seen with a bow was Izo Shimabuku. I spent a week with him in a training session uh, in New England States years ago. I think it was about 1974. And he put on a bow demonstration 
that I still remember. I mean, I was just that in awe or uh, shocked with the way this person could move the bow uh, that I couldn't believe it. He was so powerful, so strong, and he moved the bow as, as a complete weapon. If Everything he did created that whoosh you heard with the nunchucks. Everything, every move he made with that bow was a whoosh with that bow, and he would lace that bow full power. And I could see him in real combat when I saw him do a kata or a form. And you gotta remember that a kata or a form is you expressing yourself, whether it's empty hand or with a weapon. Kata or form is a form of expression. When you learn to do public talking, you talk down, you talk up, that's expressing yourself. You, when you do a kata or a form, are expressing that you know how to fight. You're expressing that you know how to fight with this weapon. When he moved through that form with that weapon, I knew he knew how to fight with it. You didn't have to see him use that weapon against you to understand that he could fight with that weapon. The second man that I saw use that weapon that I, I thought was very deadly was Seiyu Oyata. He's a 10th degree black belt, and Seiyu Oyata moved with his bow, deadly, but he goes after pressure points. He would attack uh, the nerves and the pressure points, and a lot of you have been to my empty hand seminars, or you have my tapes on pressure points and nerve attacks. Well, the same pressure points and nerves that we teach with the empty hand are all attacked with the weapon. Same ones, we don't use any different ones. We use the same uh, pressure points, the same nerve angles, and the attack that we would use with the empty hand. The weapon's nothing more than an extension of the body. They would get so good with the, with the weapon. Uh, I might as well tell you this, but uh, Sayo Yada had a man dressed up in full kendo armor. Mask, padding, chest bubble, arms. Took the pressure points that you've seen me knock people out with the empty hand. He just took the bow staff and would wrap the pressure points and wrap and make the man pass out through his armor. So that'll just show you how deadly you be can become with the bow. And the bow being made of teak wood, this again is a sport bow, but a real bow would go down to be about a quarter inch on the ends. It would come to a quarter inch. It would be tapered from an inch and a half in the middle down to near sharp. Now you all know that you could take a pencil and do damage by spearing it at somebody. Well, you can imagine if this were about a quarter inch thick and fully tapered and it was hardwood and it was thrust into that chest, you can pierce the uh, sternum or chest cavity with that particular weapon. And that's how they use these weapons for real or for real combat. Everything that we do is a sport version and to be used to tournaments and to be graded and you'll probably never use this weapon in, in reality. At least we hope not. For reality, this is the most practical of the weapons. I've seen people do belt demonstrations where you can take off any belt, your karate belt, the belt you wear to hold your pants up, and you can pull it tight and all the moves that you learn today with the bow can be done in belt fighting or belt self-defense. I've seen some people create some amazing self-defense by taking off their belt, holding it tight, doing the bow moves, but then the belt has the flexibility of wrapping around the arm to contain someone or around the neck to strangle, etc. So the same moves that we do with the stick are done with the belt. You can use anything that resembles a stick. A pool cue, a broom, a shovel, all the same moves. The Okinawans you will see use an oar or do an <coughs> oar form. An oar, like rowing a boat, and that's because if they would be out in the boats, they practiced the kator form with the oar. Legend has it that they were so good with that blade of that oar that they could like cut a head off with, with a full swing of that oar in a level position. They could just attack and hit you with this end of the oar and bring that other end around and, and uh, do severe damage, or they didn't cut it off, but severe damage to the head or that area with the oar. But you can do that with a shovel, a broom, mop, anything, when you learn uh, self-defense with this particular weapon. Okay. The minute you pick up a bow, you should pick it up at the balance. That means you should just pick it up and feel balance. There should be as much on this side as there is on this side. It shouldn't be lopsided. It shouldn't be lopsided. You should just pick it up right at the balance. People will tell you that 
One end is offense, and one end's defense. Either end is offense or defense. They can't be defined. This move can be an attack, but this move can be an attack. If he had his weapon coming at me and I use this move to put it down, I can come behind the head with this move. I can use that move for an attack. Or he could be coming with his bow here and then I use that move and that would be the offense. So either end, you can't define offense or defense. A lot of times I'll go out, somebody will do a bow for him and they'll do a move like this and say, well, that's just for blocking the bow or knocking his bow out of his hand. That's wrong. Why can't it be for hitting the person upside the head or attacking what's holding the bow? If someone has the weapon in their hand, we do not do this. When you see people doing this type of thing, that's to entertain you. That's entertaining when they click bows like that. Actually, bow fighting, I would hold the bow, he'd be at a distance, and I would connect with his knuckles, or connect with his elbow, or connect with the head. I'm not worried about a stick. If I connect with the knuckles or the elbow fast and hard, he's going to drop the stick. So, so we just attack, attack with the bow. We don't block as such. Okay. <clears throat> we use a short stick so we don't hit each other and to learn. Then when we're not around, you should practice with a six-foot bow. The bow should be held as wide as if your hands were on your hips without the weapon. If your bow is held as wide as your hips, then you will be able to do all of these moves and fit inside your own arm. Everything will, will be proper. If you're too wide, you'll be leaning off balance. If you're too narrow, you will not be able to fit inside your own arm for the move. The move will, it will add stretch to your wrist, which adds flexibility to your empty hand kata move. It adds quickness to your hitting someone moves. Just snapping the wrist we use to hit or attack or defend. And the bow will get that stretch so you get play in that wrist. Bow exercise number one, the bow is held as wide as if the hands are on the hips and you go above your head and you stop. You should not be too high. I see some way up too high. Bring it down, you should be high enough to protect the head, but the arm should act like a spring. If you notice when I hit his bow, you'll see the body vibrate. you see the arm shock. What? Don't want to do that? Put that down in a new bow. <laughs> Replacement. Whoa. That's it yours. <laughs> you come over here, you go over there. Use that half. We'll get you a new one. You're covering above the head. The arm should vibrate with shock and stop. High enough to cover the head, but not so high that you can't recover to drop the weapon immediately down. Now you're going to take your left arm. You're going to go this way, and you're going to raise the bow and cover the outside. The bow should now be outside your own leg. The opposite hand should be here. In other words, this is improper. I can attack the elbow with the, the, the top hand being here. He has no power behind it. I could actually force my way into him. He has no power to stop this regardless of his strength. So this is an improper move with the bow. I can attack and get in on him. He really wants this hand, the opposite side, to be what we call power drive across. This hand being near the hip has power to stop, but you also have the leg that can absorb some shock where you don't want him to hit the head. Now, when someone attacks above and below, and they're going to attack out here. 
If they wanted to attack the other side, all you do is wipe across the body like that. Now that does put the top hand there, but it's only done for a quick parry. That's not an initial blocking move. An initial blocking move has the rear arm as your power drive arm. So if we're stopping moves coming at you on top, it would be one, two, three, four. Don't want to toss it. You'll get hit. If someone's attacking you from here, and then they're attacking down here, and they're attacking out here, and they're attacking here, you have to pull across to stop it. If you try to tumble, you've been hit. So when you cover one side, like a windshield wiper, you have to do that. Understand? If I do this, and she tries to tumble, she's been hit. She'll get me inside her weapon, and she'll toss over on the other side of it. So if you're fighting somebody with this, this is the way it's got to be. Okay, let's try it. Bow exercise number one. Normally when I teach the bow, you do these three exercises, you go home. Come back to an these three, teaching you the kata or the form is easy. Because you know the moves with the bow. Now we're going to try to do it all in one day for some of you. One, <clears throat> two, get in a horse stance. Three, four. One, two, now go the opposite side first. Three, four. Bow exercise number one is an eight count exercise. It's actually one, two, three, four. Then you go back, one, two, three, four. You'll cover the opposite side each time for a count of eight. Okay, bow exercise number two covers an H pattern, the letter H. You're covering and striking the ribs of the midsection. You're covering or striking straight up and down pattern. You're covering here and straight up and down. You're up and down, the bow should lock on your shoulder. Your down should be locked under your forearm. I see so many people in books and magazines, the bow is like that. Like that, separated from their own elbow. Or off on an angle like this, off that elbow. It's to be locked here for body. So bow exercise number two, simply an exercise. You're gonna to go to the left hip. One. You're gonna go straight up, you're on the hip. You're gonna go straight up for your own shoulder. You're going to come down to the hip. Now you should lock with that forearm. You're going to cross. And you're going to come straight up and come down. Ready position. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Okay. When you come under that forearm, everybody go to this side. <clears throat> Your forearm must lay on the bow, actually make full contact. That's with any of the weapons. When you learn to use the side or the sickle and you have it folded along the arm, it must make contact with the arm. That is your force. That weapon is there to protect your arm off on an angle like that, it's going to be knocked against your arm. Sprain or break your wrist. If he has that locked with his forearm, look at the strength he has. Look at that strength. The whole body absorbs the shock, and I can't just take that weapon and punch it down on the person. It becomes a piece of them right there. Okay, bow exercise number three is going to deal with the letter X. <clears throat> That's your area of concentration. And when you attack with the bow, you are striking in this region, very vulnerable region to strike because it's what we call you can't miss. If you hit here, you're going to injure the shoulder joint itself. If 
you hit back at the brachial plex area, you're going to injure that. You're going to hit the collarbone, you're going to injure it. You're going to hit the nerve, you're going to hit the neck, you're going to injure. You're going to hit the ear, going to cause ringing sensation. Knock him out probably. Injure the eardrum. Knock him off balance. Hit the temple, same thing. So you really have this whole section. Most of the 45 downward strikes are geared for striking in there because no matter where you go, a bow gets slippage. If I strike an arm, I can slip down that arm and not have hit his elbow. You can get slippage here, but you slide into the collarbone. This is a safe region. So many of the katas you will see will have 45 slices down and they are attacking to that region. And when they do head on, we call this a punch with the weapon, then they are punching straight at the body. But punches you have to watch because if you miss or slippage, you'll go through his arm or you could slide off his chest. If he turns, the bow would slide off the chest. So that's why you'll see so many strikes aimed at that area with that weapon. Bow exercise number three, you're here. You're going to come over to the hip. You're going to go straight for the shoulder. Now wiggle your outside fingers. Everybody wiggle those outside fingers. Take that hand and go to the opposite hip. Now go, you're going to wiggle your outside fingers and go straight to your shoulder. Wiggle your outside fingers, go to opposite hip. Let's do it again, let's go up. Now wiggle out here. Now take that hand, pull to here. Now wiggle the outside ones, pull straight to your shoulder. And again, the bow should be level and right on the shoulder. And opposite hip. shoulder to hurt it, then as I demonstrated with the nunchuck, you don't have control. People have told me, or I, I just heard, somebody would hit himself with the bow so hard, break his own rib. I just heard that at my tournament. That person doesn't have control. That's the same as I did with the nunchuck, swinging in full power. I don't swing at full power the entire way or it would hit me. My power concentrations for him and then it comes into nothing. My power concentration is for him, and then I fade here. So this doesn't snap power. When you use a bow, the biggest mistake I see at tournaments, or people using a bow, is they try to use both hands equal, and they look clumsy. They're, they're both hands as if both hands are using this weapon. That's clumsy. Next biggest mistake I see is prodding. Thinking because they have this stick, they have to do this with the shoulders. A front punch is this. A front punch, the body's erect, you attack. An attack with the stick is nothing more than your front punch. But yet people, when they get a weapon in the hand, want to lean or think they have to add emphasis to it. Nothing changes over empty hand techniques. Actually, you can take any empty hand form you know. Learn bow exercise one, two, and three properly and go home and work it out to a bow. Just Tayuka one, the H pattern kata, that most styles just do an H pattern. We've had beginners that we've had them just do that with a bow, especially the children, because they already know that pattern. We teach them bow exercise one, two, and three. Then we just have them do the bow to Tayoka one because they know it. Then we teach them one of these forms. But you can actually do that with any form you know. Any one of the advanced forms you know, for brown belt, for black belt, pick up a bow, go home, and work it out. And just whatever was a blocking move or, or an attacking move in a kata, just make sure you just do the same with this. If it was a front punch in a kata, that means it's this. If it was a hand movement coming down, that means it's that bow coming down. Okay, we're going to start bow, extra, bow two.
bow form two. We're going to start it. So everybody take the bow and put it on the floor with your right hand. behind. Both palms should be facing forward. You go out into a left foot stance and slash down with your weapon. You're going to turn to the right wall in a right foot forward stance and cover. And your left hand's up top. Your left hand's up top. You're going to go back to the front, facing front, and your right foot goes lead and your right slashes down. The weapon drops back and again it drops back as you move. So it drops back, you cross and you stick. And that's a thrust, we call that a punch. You drop the weapon back and you step in a right foot forward and you punch. Again, you cross the feet, you drop back and you strike. Now you take the left leg and go back to your knee. And you strike someone there in their knees. One, two. You leave the bow that's under the left arm. It's going to go to the left shoulder, and you're going to strike directly behind you in someone's groin. You're going to kick them and land facing front. Now stay that way. For control. As close when you do that kick, as close as you can kick to your bow, that looks the nicest. So when you throw that bow back in that direction and you lace that kick, lace it right at the end of your own bow. If you're a higher kicker, throw the bow higher. But keep your bow and your kick together, not separated. It looks nicer. Throw that bow out, kick. Land facing the other way. Now you're going to go to the right, <clears throat> get into a right foot forward stance, and cover. The left end of the bow, fish hooks, slash down with the right, drop back and strike. Facing front, get in a horse stance, but cover to the left. Let the right hand drop a little bit, Take the left hand and draw a circle. That's now the guide hand. Pull the weapon back a touch and stick him in the throat. Quick block above your head. Okay, everyone stay right there. going to step and pick the weapon up. Step, pick the weapon. Reach behind, palm facing out. You're going to step into a left foot forward stance and slash on a 45 degree angle at your opponent. Do it. Stop there. You're going to look to the right and you're going to step to the right in a right foot forward stance and cover. Protect yourself with the angle and the angle of that weapon at that point should be the same angle as your body, covering your knee, covering your head, it's a good 45 degree angle. You're going to step forward in a right foot forward stance and slash down. 
be on your right hip or your left hip at this point. The weapon should drop back as you step. Do it. You're here. That's it. And, and stick the person. Drop the weapon back and step out and stick the person. Drop the weapon back and go forward and stick the person. Drop to your knee. Stop. We just want you all together. Normally you would do that quick. And attack his knees twice. One, two. The weapon should be on your left hip. You're going to rise to the balls of your feet directly behind you and hit someone in the groin with the right hand or the forward side of that weapon. Do it. And kick. Kick and land facing front. The weapon should have a good 45 degree angle. Good 45 degree angle on the weapon protecting you. You're facing me. Now you're going to turn to your right with your left hand coming on top to protect. Do it. Now you're going to take your left hand and hook his weapon, hook, and slash down with your right, and draw back and stick him. You're going to go to a horse stance facing front. You should be in a horse, but the weapon's protecting to your left. Drop your right hand or lower it, and circle with the left, and strike him in the throat. Immediately protect above your head too high up. Now you're going to repeat what you know. You're going to step forward with the right and slash down. You're going to step behind. Right, step forward. There you go. Out with the right. Stay. Again. You're going to take that left leg and drop backwards as you hook his weapon. Hook his weapon. Slash to your hip and strike him. Now cover. Or protect yourself in that position. Now you are to leap two steps backwards. Leap. Okay. I would say that's about two or three feet. It should be a dead leap. Anytime you leap in a cut that the feet should both pick up and land at the same time. I shouldn't hear boom boom. It should be just one set. In fact, if you learn the kata properly, you shouldn't hear the feet land at all. You should float. Now immediately hook his weapon with your left hand and slash down and attack him with a yell. <laughs> Turn to the right corner and draw a little circle away from your body. So it should be towards your shoulder. It should really be down and under this way. Down and under this way, clockwise. Down there and then draw back and stick. Don't move. Take your left hand and take it to the left corner. You should be pulling this right portion in close to you, down and under, and stick. Leave the left leg there. Take the right leg and step backward into a horse stance and strike behind you. Look to the front, strike. Look to the back, strike. Leave the weapon to the right side, or the side it's at now. You're going to turn in a left foot forward stance and swing the weapon to the hip. It should be on your left hip. You're going to step forward and take your left hand and put it underneath your right armpit. Left hand underneath the right armpit. At that point, the weapon should be perfectly straight ahead. You're going to step back up to attention, propeller the weapon in front of you like that with a hold, bring it into the shoulder, put the hand by the side, and you bow. And you freeze, stay in that position. Breast in bogo gear. In other words, you get the mask, the hood, the arm pads, the gloves, the chest protector, and you do exactly as if you were freestyle sparring without a weapon. It's the same. I try to tap your gear. If you have the gear on and I tap it and get an echo sound, I got a point. You try to stop, but what nullifies that is a smack to my knuckles. But I would have gloves on. That's how you would do it. But you would actually do it this way. 
The stuff you see like this is the Hollywood movies. You know, they do this in tournaments, and this looks great, but that's, that's all it is. And every now and then somebody will leap over one of the sticks, and he'll kill him and finish it. But the real fighting will be like the knuckles, knuckles, got the knuckles, got the neck, got the knuckles, got the neck. It's all for knuckles or wrist, pressure point on the wrist, pressure point on the arm that numbs. It's easier to do with the stick, right? It hurts more. They hit the... Catch somebody in the point's going to hurt more, but you simulate for the knuckles. And then a lot of times the weapon coming down can be for the head, can be for the hand, and then the move coming up can be just to get it out of. If I really hit these knuckles hard, that coming up can get the weapon out and strike him simultaneously. So, I mean, you just take his weapon, knock it away, and strike. And that fish hook that we use is just to get on this side of the weapon. If I was here, and I really want the knuckles, and I don't want to hit with that, because it looks like he's going to do something over there, I might want to fish. Knuckles. Bang. That's what those moves are for. So we're going to try to do those in slow motion. But you don't have gear on. So I, I want, want this side to simulate on the count of one, coming for that side's neck. I want that side to avoid and simulate a strike through the hand. Try it. Ready? We'll talk you through it. One. Now you should be touching his stick or simulating a knuckle strike. Next count. Take your left hand right up through his stick on the other side and head for his neck. And then on the next strike, you withdraw just a touch and poke. There you go. Let's try it again. When I would poke with the weapon, I would not poke the neck. You understand? I would not poke the neck. I can miss. I can slip off. I might do damage, but it's too easy to slip off. I'd go right in for what they call the jugular notch, which is right here. That's where I would poke. Or I would go for the sternum, right here. Or if I went for the xiphoid process, which is right there, bottom of the sternum. The bow was sharpened down to a half inch or a quarter inch on the end so that it could get to the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is a little, it looks like my little finger lying in the middle of the sternum. The xiphoid process has nerves attached behind it. If the xiphoid process is broke off, supposedly you die. I don't know that for a matter of fact, but that's, that's what everything says, that you would die if that were broke off. The bow was sharpened down, so a lot of these thrusts were directly for that. They'd be aimed directly for that to break it off or do some damage. As I told you before, if you had a bow and it were made of teak wood, and it were sharpened down to a quarter inch, you can just pierce the chest, pierce the sternum. And you all know you can take a lead pencil and do that to somebody if you want it to hard enough. It's how much drive you put behind that weapon. So try it again. Ready? This side's going to slash down. One, two, three. Simulate. Back. Looks good. Looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. One, two. Three. Complete each move as if it was self-defense. One. Two. Three. Back. One. Two. Three. And, and you should actually avoid. In other words, Never. rather than stay here, when, when he's coming at you, you want to get what he's after out of the way. So you want to do a little lean, bam. Yes. That's why you're not able to move it. Then come back. Ready? One. Two. Three. Back. One. Two. Three. Back.
very difficult if someone... Feeling gloves or no gloves, it's tingling, and you want to let go of the weapon. It's just, this is a lot of this is legend, but they say that the, an actual bow fighter in the days that it meant life or death. Uh, I explained that earlier, could have a broken hand. This hand could be broken. And he would use that other hand, because only one hand has to be loose. And one hand has to be a power drive hand on the weapon. And so if it was smashed, they would try to uh, uh, move this way to avoid. They would just shift. If I saw you coming up my knuckles, if I just did this, you're going to miss. But let's say you did catch them and you broke them. They would still go for the finish because it meant life or death. I couldn't drop my weapon at that point or give up. You were going to kill me. We're talking a life or death fight. That's why the third bokata has the hands or trains the hands to do this kind of a motion where the hand will do that because they would do a lot of covering when they could like this. That hand had to hang on. If he's coming at those knuckles, this would happen. They would try to do moves like that and then still go for the finish. I mean, you would try to get it out of the way or if you did take the shot on the knuckles and it was broken, they would still go with that other hand for the kill or try to because he was going to kill you. So that's really what it meant. I used to teach uh, knife defense and knife fighting in the military. And it, it sounds cruel, but if you were stuck with a knife, you were to leave it in you and, and kill your opponent. That's what we used to teach. If he gets it back, he's going to use it again on you. If the knife is stuck in you, you're to grab it and keep it there and go after him for the kill. The weapon's to stay there. And you're to kill him, because he gets it back out, you're going to bleed faster, and he's still got the knife. So, I mean, now you're bleeding, and he's still got the knife. So you have to uh, get that knife that way. It sounds cruel, but when it's taught that way in knife fighting, that's the way it's to be in a life or death situation. We're talking life or death now. We're not talking playing in a karate school with a rubber knife. We're talking someone has stuck you with a knife. You are to grab and hold it and use his other hand and foot to go for the kill on him, because he's going to do it with you. He gets the knife back, he's gonna, certainly going to kill you. That's why he stuck you to begin with. So you're to leave it there. Okay, let's try it with the other side doing the same motion. This side is now coming down towards your shoulder. Some of you know one and two, and the next time uh, we will not do uh, the bow exercises, at least you should be teaching them to each other so we don't need to waste any time on those, and we would do bow three. We do bow three, and probably do uh, more self-defense with the bow, so you get some ideas of self-defense. But the self-defense with the bow is like freestyle sparring. You, you really, if you really want to get good at that, then that's a separate part. You would just do it. Those are the train with it. Put on the gear and they actually fight with the bow. Other than that, if you're going to use it for sport, practice some self-defense with it, get some ideas on how to move it, but this is not going to mean life or death to you. At least I don't, I hope not. Okay. Is that safe? Right. Everybody's released. <laughs> Kim, do you know where we're at? Yeah, it's a Seki City in Japan. Seki? Seki. Seki? Seki City. In near Gifu. And they make swords here. These are old ones on display. Some signed. Very old. We're going to witness the making of some of those swords. It's a sign. Yeah. 
きやがって<笑>すいませんじゃあギーペンシルバニアペンシルバニアシーゼルフィアの近くですはいそれでなんか,かん最後なんですかあこんなシートがあ,<笑>ありますけどああ特別だわねあそれがまたね、やっぱり特別で、あ,あのね。そうですね。今は日本じゃあんまり。うん、あんまりやっぱり、あのね、まあなかなか空手も多い。Samurai sword, it has to be.、Yes. He makes a good blade. Thank、you